Disclaimer. The following audiobook presentation of Jacques Vallée's Passport to Magonia is intended for educational and informational purposes only. This is a non-commercial project by DisinfoZone aimed at disseminating this seminal work to a new audience interested in ufology. We assert that this falls under fair use under United States copyright law, serving the public interest without affecting the market for the original work. We highly recommend purchasing a copy of this book, as well as other works by Jacques Vallée, to support his invaluable contributions to the field. Visuals in this presentation are produced by Static Void Studio, to whom we are deeply indebted. Chapter 3. The Secret Commonwealth. Quote, to know human life one must go deep beneath its sunny exterior, and to know that summer sea which is the fairy faith one must put on a suit of armour and dive beneath its waves and behold the rare corals and moving sea palms and all the brilliant creatures who move in and out among those corals and sea palms and the horrible and awful creatures too, creatures which would devour the man were his armour not of steel for they all mingle together in the depths of that sea, hidden from our view as we sail over the surface of its sunlit waters only. End quote. Walter Wentz, The Fairy Faith in Celtic Countries. The teletype message arrived in Dayton, Ohio, on September 9, 1966, through military channels. The full text, about four pages long, was quite unintelligible, Without knowledge of the Air Force procedure for the transmission of UFO reports, the message is shortened by reference to known standardized questions that are never repeated in the text itself. With the help of the standard questionnaire, however, it is generally possible to find out what the sender is trying to describe. This particular message had originated at Kelly Air Force Base, Texas, and was addressed to the Air Force Systems Command, Headquarters, U.S. Air Force, and the Secretary. It bore the headline, Unclassified Routine, and the title UFO Report is submitted in accordance with AFR 200-2. Kelly Air Force Base was sending something very close to a ghost story. The report made reference to two separate incidents, occurring respectively on August 6th and September 3rd, 1966, in a small Texas town. The author of the report is a father of four children. We shall call him Robert. His house is located in a fairly isolated spot, and he has never discussed the incidents with his neighbours. On August 6th, the three youngest children, ages six to nine, noticed a dark object shaped like an upside-down cup. Although it was afternoon, the children had not seen the object arrive. It was dark, without colour and without lights. Then a square yellow light appeared, like a door opening, and a small creature was seen in the square of light. The entity, three to four feet tall, was dressed in black clothing which reflected a yellow or gold colour. The observation lasted several minutes, then the door closed. A low humming sound became audible, and the object took off toward the northeast, rising sharply, but at an unexceptional speed. These details, naturally, were not given spontaneously by the children. The story was reconstituted during the investigation. At no time did the object touch the ground. It hovered at a height of about 15 feet near a tree, which was found undamaged, about 35 feet from the house. The second sighting took place on September 3rd. Most of the family had gone away, but the oldest daughter had remained in the house with a friend. They were watching television in the afternoon when the set snowed, then went out. The house was lit up with eerie red and yellow light, which appeared to be circling or twirling. They looked outside and saw an object hovering in the same position, by the same tree, as in the first sighting. Its shape, again, was that of an upside-down cup, with a flat disc beneath, like a saucer. It was covered with light and departed shortly afterward. No sign of life was apparent inside or outside the craft. Two days later, Robert was propped up in bed. Through his door and across the hall, he could see a dark doorway leading to his son's bedroom. All of a sudden he saw a small person, three and a half to four feet tall, dressed in tight-fitting clothes, enter the dark bedroom. He assumed it was his small daughter going in to talk to her mother, who was in the room with his sons. About ten minutes later he saw something like a bar of light, which appeared to crumble. He got up and went to the room, where he found his wife and the boys, who had also seen the bar of light. 
He did not see the person in white leave, and his wife stated their daughter had not been in the room at any time. There was no physical evidence to substantiate the presence of the small person in the house. The rocks were full of them. On the island of Aramor, a man named Old Patsy, whom we met in Chapter 2, told Walter Wentz a true story about the fairies. Quote, Twenty years or so ago, around the bed of Dermot and Grania, just above us on the hill, there were seen many fairies, crowds of them and a single deer. They began to chase the deer and followed it right across the island. At another time, similar little people chased a horse. The rocks were full of them, and they were small fellows. End quote. Another person told Wentz, quote, My mother used to tell about seeing the fair folk dancing in the fields near Cardigan, and other people have seen them around the Cromlech up there on the hill. They appeared as little children in clothes like soldiers' clothes and with red caps, according to some accounts. End quote. While Wentz was recording material in Ireland, he went to Ratra with Dr. Hyde, and they were told this story about a leprechaun. Quote, One day I was gathering berries along a hedge not far from here, and something made me turn over a flat stone, which I saw in the ditch where I stood. And there beneath the stone was the most beautiful little creature I have ever seen in my life, and he in a hole as smug as could be. He wasn't much larger than a doll, and he was most perfectly formed with a little mouth and eyes. I turned the stone over again and ran as hard as I could to bring my mother, but when we got back we couldn't see a thing of him." End quote. Now since we are getting to the central idea of this book, I will quote two more stories, both of them landing reports from her richest period in terms of number of landings reported, autumn 1954, in UFO history. Both stories come from France. The first case took place on October 9th. Four children living in pournoy la chetive Moselle, reported that at about 6.30 p.m., as they were roller skating, they suddenly saw something luminous near the cemetery. Quote, It was a round machine, about 2.5 meters in diameter, which was standing on three legs. Soon a man came out. He was holding a lighted flashlight in his hand and it blinded us but we could see that he had large eyes, a face covered with hair, and that he was very small, about four feet tall. He was dressed in a sort of black sack, like the cassock Imlacur wears. He looked at us and said something we did not understand. He turned off the flashlight. We became afraid and ran away. When we looked back, we saw something in the sky. It was very high, very bright, and flew fast. End quote. The second case is a classic one. It happened on Sunday, September 26th, in Chabier, Drôme. At about 2.30 p.m., Mrs. Leboeuf was gathering blackberries along a hedge. Yes, it is almost the exact duplication of the leprechaun story when, quote, the dog began to bark and then started howling miserably. She looked around and saw the little animal standing at the edge of a wheat field in front of something that she thought at first was a scarecrow. But going closer, she saw that the scarecrow was some kind of small diving suit made of translucent plastic material, three feet tall or a little taller, with a head that was also translucent, and suddenly she realized that inside the diving suit was a thing, and that behind the blurred transparency of the helmet, two eyes were looking at her. At least she had the impression of eyes, but they seemed larger than human eyes. As she realized this, the diving suit began to move toward her with a kind of quick, waddling gait." End quote. At this point, Mrs. Leboeuf fled in terror and hid in a nearby thicket. When she tried to locate the entity, there was nothing to be seen, but all the dogs in the village were furiously barking. All of a sudden, a large metallic circular object rose from behind some trees and took off toward the northeast. People who had heard the witnesses' cries soon gathered around her. At the site where the disc had been seen to rise, a circle was found about ten feet in diameter, where shrubs and bushes had been crushed. Quote, from one of the acacia trees at the edge of this circular imprint hung down a branch more than three inches thick, broken by pressure from above. The branch of another acacia, which hung over the circular mark eight and a half feet above the ground, was entirely stripped of its leaves. The first few yards of wheat, in the path of the object as it took off through the field, were flattened out in radiating lines." End quote. I hardly need underline the similarity between the depression left by this object and the various kinds of rings or nests we have already studied. 
Let us now return to the Fionns, the dwarfish race that accompanies the Corrigans, the fairies of Brittany. They are seen only at twilight or at night. Some carry a torch like a Welsh death candle. They have swords no bigger than pins. According to Vilmark, a careful distinction should be drawn between Corrigans and dwarfs. The latter are a hideous race of beings with dark or even black hairy bodies, with voices like old men and little sparkling black eyes. A man who wrote to me after reading Anatomy of a Phenomenon pointed out that although he was unconvinced about the existence of the unidentified flying objects, he had discovered something he thought might be of interest to me. And he continued thus, quote, I've spent several years doing research on the Cherokee Indian, which is a branch of the Iroquean tribe. When the Cherokees migrated into the hills of Tennessee, they came upon a strange race of moon-eyed people who could not see in the daylight. The Cherokees, being unable to understand these wretches, expelled them. Barton, in 1797, states, These people were a strange white race, far advanced, living in houses, etc. Haywood, 26 years later, states, The invading Cherokees found white people near the head of Little Tennessee, with forts extending down as far as the Chickamauga Creek. He gives the location of three of these forts. End quote. Confirmation of my correspondence report is found in the excellent book Mound Builders of Ancient America, The Archaeology of a Myth, where Robert Silverberg quotes Barton's New Views of the Origins of the Tribes and Nations of America, published in Philadelphia in 1798, and dedicated to Thomas Jefferson. Quote, The Cherokee tell us that when they first arrived in the country which they inhabit, they found it possessed by certain moon-eyed people who could not see in the daytime. These wretches were expelled." End quote. Silverberg adds that Barton left the clear implication that these albino people were responsible for the Tennessee mounds. Let us come to the point now. It would be nice to hold on to the common belief that the UFOs are craft from a superior space civilization because this is a hypothesis science fiction has made widely acceptable, and because we are not altogether unprepared, scientifically and even perhaps militarily, to deal with such visitors. Unfortunately, however, the theory that flying saucers are material objects from outer space, manned by a race originating on some other planet, is not a complete answer. However strong the current belief in saucers from space, it cannot be stronger than the Celtic faith in the elves and the fairies, or the medieval belief in lutins, or the fear throughout the Christian lands in the first centuries of our era of demons and satyrs and fauns. Certainly it cannot be stronger than the faith that inspired the writers of the Bible, a faith rooted in daily experiences with angelic visitation. In short, by suggesting that modern UFO sightings might be the result of experiments, of a scientific or even super-scientific nature, conducted by a race of space travelers, we may be the victims of our ignorance, an ignorance that finds its cause in the fact that idiots and pedants alike, through a common reaction that psychologists could perhaps explain if they were not its first victims, have covered the fairy faith with the same ridicule as other idiots and pedants cover the UFO phenomenon. The realization that rumors of the real meaning of the UFO phenomenon set in motion the deepest and most powerful mental mechanisms makes acceptance of such facts very difficult especially since the facts ignore frontiers, creeds and races, defy rational statement and turn around the most logical predictions as if they were mere toys. It is difficult to come to grips with the UFO phenomenon, for although it clearly evolves through phases, its effects are diffuse and it cannot be dated very precisely. We have to rely on legends, hearsay and extrapolations. Much can be accomplished, however, once it is realized that the observational material on hand since World War II, the 20,000 or so clear-cut dated reports of UFOs in official and private files, is nothing but a resurgence of a deep stream in human culture known in older times under various other names. Whence, as we have seen, found several people in Celtic countries who had seen the gentry or had known people who were taken by fairies. In Brittany, he had much greater difficulty. Quote, the general belief in the interior of Brittany is that the Fays once existed, but that they disappeared as their country was changed by modem conditions. In the region of the Mene and of Erse, Ile et Vilaine, it is said that for more than a century there have been no Fays, 
and on the sea coast, where it is firmly believed that the Fays used to inhabit certain grottos in the cliffs, the opinion is that they disappeared at the beginning of the last century. The oldest Bretons say that their parents or grandparents often spoke about having seen Fays, but very rarely do they say that they themselves have seen Fays. M. Paul Sebilo found only two who had. One was an old needlewoman of Saint-Cast who had such fear of Fays that if she was on her way to do some sewing in the country, and it was night she always took a long circuitous route to avoid passing near a field known as the Couvent des Fays. The other was Marie Chehu, a woman 88 years old. End quote. The central question in the analysis of the UFO phenomenon has always been that of the controlling intelligence behind the object's apparently purposeful behavior. In stating the problem in such terms, I am not assuming that the objects are real, contrary to the implications someone might draw if he read this book too fast. Yet in no way am I excluding the possibility that this controlling intelligence is human, and I shall elaborate on this idea in later chapters. For the time being, let me simply state again my basic contention. The modern global belief in flying saucers and their occupants is identical to an earlier belief in the fairy faith. The entities described as the pilots of the craft are indistinguishable from the elves, sylphs and lutins of the Middle Ages. Through the observations of unidentified flying objects, we are concerned with an agency our ancestors knew well and regarded with terror. We are prying into the affairs of the secret commonwealth. In undertaking research into beliefs in fairies, gentry, call them what you will, confusion arises from the great variety of names and classifications given the different races of beings. In Lower Brittany alone, Paul Sebilo has found and classified 50 different names given to Lutons and Konigans, while Lutons themselves are the same as the Elvish people. Pixies in Cornwall, Robin Goodfellows in England, Golem in Wales, Gooblins in Norimafif and Brownies in Scotland. Can we establish with certainty that the two beliefs are indeed identical? I believe we can. In earlier chapters, I have already given several examples of the means of transportation used by the sylphs. The ability of the fairies to cross the continents cannot have escaped the reader's attention. In later chapters, I have several rather striking tales to tell about Indian beliefs in flying races and the aerial ships used by the gentry taking part in medieval wars. But I have not yet drawn from popular folklore the stories that support most directly the idea that strange flying objects have been seen throughout history in connection with the little people. But let us clear up this point now. Aerial Races, Farfadays and Slaymaith as late as 1850, one race of Lutons survived in France, in the region of Poitou, which has been in recent years a favourite landing area for flying saucers. The Lutons of Poitou were known as Farfadets, and the Bibliothèque Nationale in Paris contained several delightful accounts of their mischievous deeds. What were the main characteristics of the Fadets or Farfadets? They were little men, very black and hairy. All day long they lived in caves, and at night they liked to get close to the farms. Usually their favourite pastime was to play tricks on terrified women. Their dwellings were located with some precision. C. Pouchard, for instance, has reported in a lecture that Farfadets lived for a long time at La Bouladière near Terves du Sèvres in underground tunnels they had dug themselves. At La Boissière, the inhabitants described the Fadets as hairy dwarfs who played all sorts of pranks. One night in the 1850 Mirwes, near the shore of the Ygre River, a group of women talked outside until about midnight. As they were returning to the village, they had just crossed a bridge, they heard a terrible noise and saw something that froze their blood. Some object which, for lack of a better term, they called a chariot with whining wheels, was speeding up the hill with a marvellous velocity. Naturally, it was pulled by the far fadets. The terrified women hung together as they saw the apparition. One of them, although half dead with fear, made the sign of the cross. The strange chariot leapt up over the vineyard and was lost in the night. The women hurried home and told the story to their husbands, who decided to investigate. They wisely awaited dawn, however, and then bravely went to the spot as soon as the sun was up. Of course, there was nothing left to be seen. We have already been told of the travelling habits of the good people. 
What has not yet been mentioned is the belief, especially in Ireland, that conditions among humans arc related to the travels of the fairies. Wendt says that according to John Glynn, town clerk of Tuam, quote, during 1846 to 47, the potato crop in Ireland was a failure and very much suffering resulted. At the time, the country people in these parts attributed the famine to disturbed conditions in the fairy world. Old T.D. Stead once told me about the conditions then prevailing. Sure, we couldn't be any other way. And I saw the good people and hundreds besides me saw them fighting in the sky over Knockmag and on towards Galway. And I heard others say they saw the fighting too. End quote. According to another popular Irish belief, the elves have two great feasts each year. The first one takes place at the beginning of spring, when the hero O'Donoghue, who used to reign over the earth, rises through the sky on a white horse, surrounded by the brilliant company of the elves. Lucky is he indeed, the Irishman who sees him rise from the depths of the Lake of Killarney. In January 1537, the people of Franconia, between Parbenburp and the forest of Thuringia, saw a star of marvellous size. It came lower and lower and appeared as a large white circle from which whirlwinds and patches of fire came forth. Falling to earth, the pieces of fire melted spearheads and ironwork, without causing harm to human beings or their houses. The favourite abode of the gentry, however, was not always an aerial one. In many tales related by the students of folklore, as in the literature of UFOs, the strange beings often come from the sea. Thus Wentz learned, quote, There is an invisible island between Innismurray and the coast opposite Grange, on which part of the gentry is supposed to reside. When it is visible, it is only visible for a short time. End quote. In the legends of Europe, it is between the 8th and the 10th centuries that celestial prodigies were most often visible. But the books on magic and demonology associate supernatural beings with celestial signs. A strange category of devils called Friday demons is described in the magical works of Henri Cornelia Agrippa. These devils are of medium height, rather handsome. Their arrival is preceded by a brilliant star. According to the Western Kabbalists, the sylphs flew through the air with the speed of lightning, riding a peculiar cloud. It is noteworthy, too, that in France, some fairies are supposed to bear a luminous stone, an object that is often part of the equipment of flying saucer occupants. Many a little man has a light on either his belt, chest or helmet. In a French tradition that survives in modern novels, the fortunate mortal who can steal the fairy's luminous stone is sure of lifelong happiness. On June 17, 1790, near Alençon, France, there was an apparition so strange and so disturbing that police inspector Lea Boeuf was instructed to make a thorough investigation. His report reads thus, in part, quote, At 5 a.m. on June 12, Several farmers caught sight of an enormous globe, which seemed surrounded with flames. First they thought it was perhaps a balloon that had caught fire, but the great velocity and the whistling sound which came from that body intrigued them. The globe slowed down, made some oscillations and precipitated itself towards the top of a hill, unearthing plants along the slope. The heat which emanated from it was so intense that soon the grass and the small trees started burning. The peasants succeeded in controlling the fire which threatened to spread to the whole area. In the evening this sphere was still warm and an extraordinary thing happened, not to say an incredible thing. The witnesses were two mayors, a doctor and three other authorities who confirmed my report, in addition to the dozens of peasants who were present. This sphere, which would have been large enough to contain a carriage, had not suffered from all that flight. It excited so much curiosity that people came from all parts to see it. Then all of a sudden, a kind of door opened, and there is the interesting thing. A person like us came out of it, but this person was dressed in a strange way, wearing a tight-fitting suit, and seeing all that crowd, said some words which were not understood, and fled into the wood. Instinctively, the peasants stepped back in fear, and this saved them because soon after that the sphere exploded in silence, throwing pieces everywhere, and these pieces burned until they were reduced to powder. Researches were initiated to find the mysterious man, but he seemed to have dissolved." End quote. 
Let us follow the strange beings across the world now, to Mexico, where an American anthropologist, Brian Strauss from Berkeley, reports that the Zeltal Indians have strange legends of their own. One night, Strauss and his Indian assistant discussed these legends of the Ikals or Ikals, the little black beings after seeing a strange light wandering about in the Mexican sky. The Ikals are three foot tall, hairy, black humanoids whom the natives encounter frequently. And Strauss learned, quote, about 20 years ago or less, there were many sightings of this creature or creatures, and several people apparently tried to fight it with machetes. One man also saw a small sphere following him from about five feet. After many attempts, he finally hit it with his machete, and it disintegrated, leaving only an ash-like substance. End quote. The beings were observed in ancient times. They fly, they attack people, and in the modern reports, they carry a kind of rocket on their backs and kidnap Indians. Occasionally, Stross was told, people have been paralyzed when they came upon the Eichels, who are said to live in caves which the natives are careful not to enter. Gordon Crichton, a staff member of the Flying Saucer Review and a former linguistic expert with the British Foreign Service, had occasion to study Indian folklore during several visits in Latin America. Commenting upon Stress's report, Crichton pointed out that words such as Ike and Ikal were found in all the dialects of the Maya Soke linguistic group. Quote, the Zeltal words Ike and Ikal, the adjective form, simply mean black being or black. In the Maya language, we find that Ike means air or wind, and Ikal means a spirit, while Ike means black. The Kekchi Maya in the Alta Vera Paz region of Guatemala talk of a Kek. The Kek, meaning black in the Kekchi dialect of Maya, is said to be a centaur-like being that guards his patron's house at night and frightens people at dusk. Black, ugly, hairy, he is half human, with human hands but the hooves of a horse. End quote. We shall return to the Ikals, or Wendis, as they are called in British Honduras, in a later chapter, in connection with another feature of their behavior. For the time being, however, the Mexican legends show quite conclusively that many, perhaps every region of the world, has its own traditions about such creatures and associates them very definitely with the idea of aerial or even cosmic origin. In the Zeltal cosmology, the Earth is flat and supported on four columns. At the base of these columns lives a race of black dwarves, and Creighton points out that their blackness is due, so runs the Indian theory, to the fact that they are scorched by the sun when he passes close to them every night as he travels through the underworld. According to the Paiute Indians, California was once populated by a superior civilization, the Hav Musuvs. Among other interesting devices, they used flying canoes, which were silvery and had wings. They flew in the manner of eagles and made a whirring noise. They were also using a very strange weapon, a small tube that could be held in one hand and would stun their enemies producing lasting paralysis and a feeling similar to a shower of cactus needles. How could primitive tribes better describe electrocution? It is interesting to gather such tales in America, but Europeans hardly have to go as far as that to find similarly interesting and forgotten episodes. The archives of the Roman Catholic Church are full of such incidents, and it cannot be doubted that many an accusation of witchcraft stemmed from the belief in strange beings who could fly through the air and approached humans at dusk or at night. Occasionally, these demons were seen in full daylight by many people, and in this context, I am not referring to the vague confessions obtained under torture from the poor men and women who fell into the clutches of the Inquisition, although this material would be quite worthy of a parallel study. I am quoting official records of the time, gathered from witnesses by clerics and policemen, of which sort of report the following account is fairly typical. In the early 17th century, the cathedral at Quimper Corentin, France, had on its roof a pyramid covered with lead. On February 1st, 1620, between 7 o'clock and 8 p.m., thunder fell on that pyramid and it caught fire, exploded and fell down with a stupendous noise. People rushed to the cathedral from all parts of the town and saw in the midst of the lightning and smoke a demon of a green colour with a long green tail doing his best to keep the fire going. This account, which was published in Paris, is supplemented by a more complete version printed in Rennes. This latter version adds that the demon was seen clearly by all inside the fire, sometimes green, sometimes blue and yellow. 
What were the authorities to do? They threw into the roaring fire a quantity of Agni D.I., close to 150 buckets of water and 40 or 50 cartloads of manure to no avail. The demon was still there, and the fire kept happily burning. Something drastic had to be done. A consecrated host was placed inside a loaf of bread and thrown into the flames, and then blessed water was mixed with milk given by a nurse of above reproach conduct, and spread over the demon and the burning pyramid. This the visitor could not stand. He whistled in a most horrible fashion and flew away. I can only recommend the recipe to the US Air Force. 800 years earlier, that is, about 830 in the days of Emperor Lothair, creatures similar to the elementals were seen very often in the northern parts of the Netherlands. According to Cornie van Kempen, they were called Dames Blanche's White Ladies. He compares them to the nymphs of antiquity. They lived in caves, and they would attack people who travelled at night. The shepherds would also be harassed, and the women who had newly born babies had to be very careful, for they were quick in stealing the children away. In their lair, one could hear all sorts of strange noises, indistinct words that no one could understand, and musical sounds. In the last half of the 17th century, a Scottish scholar gathered all the accounts he could find about the sleigh maith, and in 1691, wrote a manuscript bearing the title The Secret Commonwealth of Elves, Fauns and Fairies. The Secret Commonwealth was the first systematic attempt to describe the methods and organisation of the strange creatures that plagued the farmers of Scotland. The author, Reverend Kirk of Aberfoyle, studied theology at St Andrews and took his degree of professor at Edinburgh. Later he served as minister for the parishes of Balkeda and Aberfoyle and died in 1692. It is impossible to quote the entire text of Kirk's treatise on the secret commonwealth, but we can summarize his findings about elves and other aerial creatures in the following way. 1. They have a nature that is intermediate between man and the angels. 2. Physically they have very light and fluid bodies, which are comparable to a condensed cloud. They are particularly visible at dusk. They can appear and vanish at will. 3. Intellectually they are intelligent and curious. 4. They have the power to carry away anything they like. 5. They live inside the earth in caves, which they can reach through any crevice or opening where air passes. 6. When men did not inhabit most of the world, they used to live there and had their own agriculture. Their civilization has left traces on the high mountains. It was flourishing at a time when the whole countryside was nothing but woods and forests. 7. At the beginning of each three-month period, they change quarters because they are unable to stay in one place. Besides, they like to travel. It is then that men have terrible encounters with them, even on the great highways. 8. Their chameleon-like bodies allow them to swim through the air with all their household. 9. They are divided into tribes. Like us, they have children, nurses, marriages, burials, etc. Unless they just do this to mock our own customs, or to predict terrestrial events. 10. Their houses are said to be wonderfully large and beautiful, but under most circumstances they are invisible to human eyes. Kirk compares them to enchanted islands. The houses are equipped with lamps that burn forever and fires that need no fuel. 11. They speak very little. When they do so, when they talk among themselves, their language is a kind of whistling sound. 12. Their habits and their language when they talk to humans are similar to those of local people. 13. Their philosophical system is based on the following ideas. Nothing dies. All things evolve cyclically in such a way that at every cycle they are renewed and improved. Motion is the universal law. 14. They are said to have a hierarchy of leaders, but they have no visible devotion to God, no religion. 15. They have many pleasant and light books, but also serious and complex books, rather in the Rosicrucian style, dealing with abstract matters. 16. They can be made to appear at will before us through magic. The similarities between these observations and the story related by Fasius Cardan, which antedates Kirk's manuscript by exactly 200 years, are clear. Both Cardan and Paracelsus write, like Kirk, that a pact can be made with these creatures, and that they can be made to appear and answer questions at will. Paracelsus did not care to reveal what that pact was, because of the ills that might befall those who would try it. 
Kirk is equally discreet on this point, and of course, to go deeper into this matter would open the whole field of witchcraft, which is beyond my purpose in this book. Kirk's conclusion is that every age has left a secret to be discovered. Sooner than we think, he says, the relations with the aerial beings will be as natural to us as, say, microscopy or the printing press, all things that caused considerable surprise when they were first introduced. We can only follow him in this and give a humble salute to a man who managed to gather such a complete description of our visitors. It is remarkable that one cannot find a single writer who claims he knows the physical nature of the fairies. They give us their personal opinions on the subject or report on the various theories held during their time, but they do not assure us they have a final answer. To Kirk, the good people have bodies so, quote, pliable, thorough the subtlety of the spirits that agitate them, that they can make them appear or disappear at pleasure. Some have bodies or vehicles so spongins thin and defecate that they are fed by only sucking into some fine spirituous liquors that pierce like pure air and oil. End quote. According to medieval occultists, all invisible beings can be divided into four classes, the angels, the gods of the ancients, the devils or demons, the fallen angels, the souls of the dead, and the elemental spirits, which correspond to Kirk's secret commonwealth. In the fourth group are the gnomes, who inhabit the earth and correspond to mine-haunting fairies, goblins, pixies, corrigans, leprechauns, and the domovoys of Russian legends, and the sylphs, who inhabit the air. These subdivisions are obviously arbitrary, and Paracelsus himself will admit it is extremely difficult to provide definitions for these various classes. The bodies of the elementals are, quote, of an elastic semi-material essence, ethereal enough so as not to be detected by the physical sight, and they may change their forms according to certain laws, end quote. To start from this basis would naturally open the way to far-reaching speculations. From John McNeil of Barra, Wentz learned, quote, The old people said they didn't know if fairies were flesh and blood or spirits. They saw them as men of more diminutive stature than our own race, I heard my father say that fairies used to come and speak to natural people and then vanish while one was looking at them. Fairy women used to go into houses and talk and then vanish. The general belief was that the fairies were spirits who could make themselves seen or not seen at will. And when they took people, they took body and soul together. End quote. Another man interviewed by Wentz insisted that the fairies of the air are different from those in the rocks. Similarly, in Brittany, popular tradition divides the fairies into two groups, pygmy-sized entities endowed with magic powers and the science of prophecy, on one hand, and white aerial fairies on the other. Beings in the first category are black, hairy, their hands terminate in talons, they have old faces and hollow eyes, small and bright like burning coals. Their voices are low as if broken by age, with the remark about prophecy, we are led again to consider the relationship between the actions of the secret commonwealth and the affairs of men. Wentz, noting this relationship in ancient poetry, says that during the last fight of the great hero of Ulster, Cuchulain, who was a favorite of the Cid or fairies, one of these beings named Morigu flew over Cuchulain's head as he fought in his war chariot. Similarly, the fairies took part in the Battle of Clontarf, April 23, 1014, providing what would be called, in modern military language, air support for the Irish side. Before the battle, a fairy woman came to Dunlang O'Hartigan and begged him not to fight. She knew the issue could only be death, and here we find the prophetic powers of fairies again. He assured her that he was ready to die for Ireland. The two armies met near Dublin. Quote, It will be one of the wonders of the Day of Judgment to relate the description of this tremendous onset. There arose a wild, impetuous, precipitate, mad, inexorable, furious, dark, lacerating, merciless, combative, contentious bab which was shrieking and fluttering over their heads. And there arose also the satyrs and sprites, and destroying demons of the air and firmament, and the demoniac phantom host. End quote. This is only one of many references to the flying hosts of the fairies. We shall have occasion to study them more closely in a later chapter. But first, let us return to UFOs. Can we study modern UFO reports without reopening the entire problem of apparitions? To most UFO writers, the answer is yes. 
Unidentified flying objects, they argue, leave physical traces and behave like space probes. It is obvious to them that UFOs are scientific devices having nothing to do with the mystico-religious context of medieval apparitions and nothing to do with the creatures studied by Kirk, since, as we have just seen, these latter could appear and vanish at will. This view is no longer tenable. The reports of recent observations do describe objects that appear and vanish. It is just that such reports are not publicized. Students of UFOs are reluctant to publish them, and the witnesses themselves are not eager to come forward with stories they know are unbelievable. During a discussion with Amy Michel on this subject, he pointed out the negative reactions of scientists to his analysis of the French sightings. They argued that such fantastic stories could only come from deranged minds. What would these people have said, he remarked, if I had published all the data? Among the cases that deserve close examination, but which were swept under the rug by UFO students themselves, is the sighting at Nouatre, Indre et Loire, France, near marcilly sur vienne on September 30, 1954. About 4.30 p.m., Georges Gattay, head of a team of eight construction workers, found himself walking away from the other workers. He felt a peculiar drowsiness and suddenly wondered where he was going. Then, without warning, he found himself facing the strangest apparition. Less than 30 feet away, above him on the slope, was a man. His head was covered with an opaque glass helmet with a visor coming down to his chest. He wore grey coveralls and short boots. In his hand he held an elongated object. It could have been a pistol, or it could have been a metal rod. On his chest was a light projector. The strange man was standing in front of a large shining dome, which floated about three feet above the ground. Above the cupola of the machine were objects like rotating wings or blades. Then, quote, Suddenly the strange man vanished, and I couldn't explain how he did, since he did not disappear from my field of vision by walking away, but vanished like an image one erases suddenly. Then I heard a strong whistling sound which drowned the noise of our excavators. The saucer rose by successive jerks in a vertical direction, and then it too was erased in a sort of blue haze, as if by miracle." End quote. As soon as he saw the object and the entity, Gatai tried to run, but he found himself helplessly nailed to the spot. He was thus paralyzed during the whole observation. So were his seven co-workers, in a unique case of collective physiological reaction. None of them had previously believed in the reality of the so-called sources. As soon as he was able to move again, Gatay rushed back to his men and cried, Have you seen something? Mr. Bourrois told him, Yes, a flying saucer. And the man who was the driver of the excavator, Mr. Lubanovich, added, There was a man dressed like a diver in front of it. Four others, Messrs. Sechet, Villeneuve, Rougier and Amiro, a truck driver, confirmed all the details of the sighting. It must be pointed out that the incident took place in a remote rural region. At the time, the end of September, the French wave of reports was just beginning. But Gatay, who fought during the war with the resistance and was wounded in Luxembourg, said that he is not used to flights of fancy. Following the incident, he suffered from insomnia, strong headaches, and loss of appetite for a week. Ironically, the eight men are still not convinced that flying saucers were from another world. They feel sure they are a secret development by a terrestrial nation, probably France, in Jalapa, Mexico, early in September 1965, a hovering object with luminous slits in its circumference and a black-clad being with eyes gleaming like a cat's, holding a shining metal rod, were seen. The entity vanished suddenly while under observation in a Jalapa street by a local reporter, two taxi drivers and a bullfighter. In the Carazinho case of July 26, 1965, five dwarfs dressed in dark uniforms and small boots were seen. We are told that one of them had in his right hand a brilliantly luminous object like a wand. There was a sudden flash of lightning about 1.45 p.m. on January 28, 1967, on Studham Common, near Whipsnade Park Zoo, an isolated spot up in the Chiltern Hills in England. Rain was falling and the atmosphere was heavy, reports R.H.B. Winder, who investigated this case for the Flying Saucer Review. Seven boys were on their way to school in the vicinity of the Dell, a shallow valley and an ideal spot for playing hide-and-seek. 
Alex Butler, aged 10, was looking south over the dell when he saw clearly, in the open, quote, a little blue man with a tall hat and a beard. He called his friend, and they ran toward the figure. They were about 20 yards away when it, quote, disappeared in a puff of smoke. The boys were very much surprised, naturally, but nothing in the attitude of the strange figure had inspired fear or suggested threat, so they kept looking for the little blue man and saw him again on the opposite side of the bushes from where he was first standing. They went toward him. He vanished once more, reappearing at the bottom of the dell. This time they heard voices in nearby bushes and became slightly afraid. The voices reminded them of foreign-sounding babble. Finally, they saw the man a fourth time before they were summoned to school by the whistle. Their teacher, Miss Newcomb, noticed how excited they were, and in spite of their warnings that she would never believe them, immediately separated them and made each of the seven boys write down his experience, each in his own words. The essays were then gathered into a book called The Little Blue Man on Studham Common, which, notes Winder, makes fascinating reading and no doubt will occupy an honoured place in the archives of the Studham Village Primary School. Investigation by Winder, Molster, Bowen and Creighton disclosed a number of local sightings, among them two landings in the vicinity of the spot, within a few months of the January sighting. Naturally, the investigators were most interested in hearing the boys themselves give details on the appearance of the creature. They interviewed them in the presence of their teacher and Winder reports, quote, They estimate the little man as three feet, tall by comparison with themselves, with an additional two feet. Accounted for by a hat or helmet, best described as a tall, brimless bowler, that is, with a rounded top. The blue colour turned out to be a dim, greyish-blue glow, tending to obscure outline and detail. They could, however, discern a line which was either a fringe of hair or the lower edge of the hat. Two round eyes, a small, seemingly flat triangle in place of a nose, and a one-piece vestment extending down to a broad black belt, carrying a black box at the front, about six inches square. The arms appeared short and were held straight down close to the side at all times, the legs and feet were indistinct, end quote. As for the puff of smoke, it apparently was a whirling cloud of yellowish-blue mist shot toward the pursuers. I hardly need to quote more cases. The Magic Casement The Reverend Robert Kirk makes no bones about it. The elves did at one time occupy the land. Today it is still a common belief in the north of Scotland that the Sith or fairy people existed once, a belief that survives in their title, Good Neighbours, although they could occasionally be hostile to man. Quote, While the Sith had no inborn antagonism towards human beings and were occasionally known to do good turns to their favourites, they were very quick to take offence, capricious in their behaviour, and delighted in playing tricks on their mortal neighbours. These cantrips had to be patiently endured, as resistance or hostility might lead to dreadful reprisals. The kidnapping of children or even adults. An attitude of passive friendliness on the human side was therefore assumed to be eminently desirable. End quote. Scott refers to this when Bailey Nickel Jarvie in Rob Roy tells his companion as they pass a fairy hill near Aberfoyle, quote, They call them Dawin Sith, which signifies, as I understand, men of peace meaning thereby to make their goodwill. And we may even as well call them that too, Mr. Osbaldistone, for there's nay gude in speaking ill of the laird within his ain bounds. End quote. A Gaelic scholar, Campbell, minister of Tyree, published a story called Na Amhuiskin, the dwarfs or pygmies, in which he remarks, quote, The existence of pygmies in some unknown region bordering upon, if not forming part of, the kingdom of coldness is of interest as indicating some of the connection between smallness of person and cold climate, and so leading to the speculations as to the first dispersion of the human race and connection of tribes that are now far removed from each other in appearance, dress, mode of life, and dialects. End quote. Although the connection between climate and size is not a tenable hypothesis, Campbell's remarks do open the way to interesting speculations. He notes that the term Lapanach applies to a certain little, thick-set, insignificant man who figures in many tales, and he adds, quote, 
There are many traditional tales in the highlands of much interest in which little men of dwarfish and even pygmy size figure as good bowmen, slaying men of large size and powerful make by their dexterity in the use of the bow and arrow." End quote. In spite of their small size, they are understood to have been of very considerable strength. They were not undersized in the same way that children are, but full-grown individuals, undersized and sinewy or muscular. These dwarfs or pygmies are called Na'awiskian, or more correctly, Na'awiskian. The English phonetics for the Gaelic Amhuisk would be Awisk. The same beings are sometimes found under the names Tamhask and Amhuish, and these words uniformly designate dwarfs. It is ironic, therefore, that in one tale, the lad with the skin garments, quoted by MacDougall, the Awisks address a human intruder as O oh, Little Man, while he, in turn, calls them Big Men All. Now one point must absolutely be cleared up. Were there or were there not races of dwarves living among the West and Middle Europeans of antiquity? Were the legends about the fairies and the elves based on the fact that the ancient inhabitants of the northern parts of the British Isles were such a race? Historical and archaeological researchers definitely say no, and we must agree with them. Yet several writers, such as David McRitchie, claim there are indications in this direction. And of course, such indications would be crucial to any theory concerning the nature of the humanoids. In a book published in London in 1894, Tyson's essay concerning the pygmies of the ancients, Professor Windle of Birmingham, remarks that a race of dwarfs supplied the best warriors and bodyguard of several kings. Tyson made an extensive study of the dwarf races and quotes the Greek historian Catesius. Quote, Middle India has black men, who are called pygmies, using the same language as the other Indians. Of these pygmies, the king of the Indians has 3,000 in his train, for they are very skillful archers. There seem to have been near Lake Zera, in Persia, Negrito, pygmy black tribes, who are probably aboriginal, and may have formed the historic black guard of the ancient kings of Susania. End quote. Tyson's work, to which Windle provided the preface, was written in the 17th century. After calling attention to the remark by Catesius, it goes on, quote, Talentonius and Bartholine think that what Catesius relates of the pygmies as their being very good archers very well illustrates this text of Ezekiel. End quote. The Ezekiel text in question appears thus in the King James Bible. Quote, the men of Arvad with thine army were upon thy walls round about, and the Gamadims were in thy towers. End quote. The Genevan translation printed in Edinburgh in 1579 also has Gamadims glossed valorous men. In the Vulgate, however, it runs thus Fili Arvad cum exercitu tuo supra muros tuos persequitum, et pygmae in turibus tuis fuerunt. And indeed, the English Bishop's Bible of 1572 and 1575 does not have Gamadims, but Pygmenians. Without going into further detail, it is clear that the Gaelic story of a guard of dwarf warriors is not an isolated case. If we return now to David McRitchie's quotation from the Flemish folklore journal Ons Volksleven, we can learn more. Quote, the Fenlanders, a race dwelling in our country prior to the Celts, were little, but strong, dexterous and good swimmers, they lived by hunting and fishing. Adam of Bremen in the 11th century thus pictures their descendants or race. They had large heads, flat faces, flat noses and large mouths. They lived in caves of the rocks which they quitted in the night time for the purpose of committing sanguinary outrages. The Celtic people and later those of German race, so tall and strong, could hardly look upon such little folk as human beings. They must have regarded them as strange, mysterious creatures. And when these Negroes or Fenlanders had lived for a long enough time hidden, for fear of the new people in their grottos, especially when they at length fell into decay through poverty or died out, they became changed in the imagination of the dreamy Germans into mysterious beings, a kind of ghosts or gods. End quote. In a footnote, McRitchie states that he is not aware on what grounds this author speaks of them as black people. But he admits that these dwarfish Fenlanders might be regarded as the originals of the Awisks of the Gaelic legend. Now we seem to be getting somewhere. There is a tradition in the Orkney Isles that offers a parallel to the above story. 
Sometime in the first part of the 15th century, Bishop Thomas Tullock of Orkney gave details in De Orcadibus Insulis of the tradition that the archipelago had been inhabited six centuries earlier by the Papae and a race of dwarfs. The Papae, according to many scholars, were the Irish priests, and the dwarfs were the Picts. In this, Macritchie follows Barry's Orkney, where we read, quote, They are plainly no other than the Peaths, Picts, or Picts. The Scandinavian writers generally call the Picts petty, or pets. One of them uses the term petia instead of Pictland. And besides, the firth that divides Orkney from Caithness is usually denominated Petland Fjord in the Icelandic sagas or histories, end quote. The consistency running through these ancient accounts, McRitchie says, is indeed remarkable. The Irish priests followed St. Columba, who himself was a great-grandson of Conal Gulban, who, tradition states, had fierce battles with a race of dwarfs. Conal Gublin's fights with the dwarfs indeed are the origin of a series of tales sometimes attributed to other legendary heroes. If we try to get as close as possible to the original story, this is what we get. Conal Gulban was the son of the famous Neil or Nile, the ancestor of the O'Neills of Ulster. He was the paternal grandfather of Fedlimid, the father of St. Columba, and his adventures begin in the northwest of Ireland, somewhere in the dawn of the 5th century. After various experiences, Gulban landed in the realm of Lochlan, generally believed to be Scandinavia, which itself had a rather vague meaning at the time. There, Gulban was intrigued by a strange construction and asked his guide, What pointed house is there, Duanak? That is the house of the Tamhaisk, the best warriors that are in the realm of Lochlan, Duanak the guide replied. I heard my grandfather speaking about the Tamhaisk, said Connell, but I have never seen them. I will go to see them. It were not my counsel to thee, were Duanak's last words. This advice, naturally, Connell Gulban disregarded. He went straight to the palace of the King of Lochlan and challenged him to combat. He was told that, quote, he should get no fighting at that time of night, but he should get lodging in the house of the Amhusk, the Awisks, where there were 1,800 Amhusk and 18 score. He went and he went in, and there were none of the Amhuish within that did not grin. When he saw that they had made a grin, he himself made two. What was the meaning of your grinning at us, said the Amhusk. What was the meaning of your grinning at me, said Connell. Said they, our grinning at thee meant that thy fresh royal blood will be ours to quench our thirst, and thy fresh royal flesh to polish our teeth. And, said Connell, the meaning of my grinning is that I will look out for the one with the biggest knob and slenderest shanks, and knock out the brains of the rest with that one, and his brains with the knobs of the rest. End quote. At this point, each of the Awisks put a stake of wood against the door, and Connell asked them why they had done so. Quote, We have never seen coming here one a gulp of whose blood, or a morsel of whose flesh could reach us, but thou thyself except one other man, and he fled from us. And now everyone is doubting the other in case thou shouldest flee. That was the thing that made me do it myself likewise, since I have got yourself so close as you are, answered Connell, who had followed their lead in this action. Then he went and he began upon them. I feared to be chasing you from hole to hole and from hill to hill, and I did that. Then he gazed at them from one to two, and he seized on the one of the slenderest shanks and the fattest head. He drove upon the rest sliocht slashed till he had killed every one of them, and he had not a jot of the one with whom he was working at them, but what was in his hands of the shanks. End quote. The tale of Conal Gulban, recorded by Campbell of Islay, continues with many wonderful fights in other lands. In France, for example, Conal wins in the same absurd way over the House of the Tamhaisk, the best warriors that the King of France had. McRitchie concluded, quote, It is of course to be understood that the passage as it stands is as impossible as it is ludicrous. But this docks not interfere with the assumption that the basis of the story may be an actual encounter between men of tall stature and a race of dwarves. The excessive number of the latter and the case with which the hero swings them about being merely the embroidering of tale-tellers in later times. End quote. As for the seeming impossibility that a tale could be transmitted for 15 centuries and yet be historical, McRitchie adds, quote, 
It ought to be remembered that the oral transmission of history and genealogy, with the most careful attention in language and details, was a perfect science among the Gaelic-speaking peoples. End quote. But then, what became of the dwarfish race? According to McRitchie, the dwarfs were destroyed or went into hiding toward the 6th century, when Columba and his followers carried on a religious war against the Picts. At the same time, he says, the Irishmen were also using force against the same people in the north of Ireland. And since the new owners of the land felt for their ancient enemies a mixture of guilt and fear, numerous rumours were born concerning the ghosts of the Picts still roaming through the land. And this in turn led to the elves and fairies. This theory, generally referred to as the Pygmy theory, is however now no longer tenable in the face of the evidence historians have gathered about the Picts. The name Picti, according to Wainwright, appears first in 297 AD, and from that time on it is applied to all the peoples who lived north of the Antonine Wall and were not Scots. In earlier times we're really concerned with the predecessors of the Picts, who formed various groups called Proto-Picts. Could McRitchie's pygmies have figured among the Proto-Picts? Wainwright gives the following translation of a passage from the historic Norwegia, already referred to above. These islands were first inhabited by the Picts and the Papai. Of these, one race, the Picts, little exceeded pygmies in stature. They did marvels in the morning and in the evening in building walled towns, but at midday they entirely lost all their strength and lurked through fear in little underground houses. And Wainwright comments, the story is interesting in that it brings together Picts, Sauteranes and perhaps Brocks, at once explaining the common belief that the Picts were a pygmy people and providing an early example of the mistaken equations implicit in the names Picts houses, Sauteranes and Pictish towers Brocks. Should we believe that among the Proto-Picts there were dwarves who were mistaken for a native people? And then, where did they come from? McRitchie's theory offers only confusion, and it is amusing to observe his embarrassment when he must report that the Fenlanders were not only dwarfish, but black too. Could it be that there were Eichels in Northern Europe at the dawn of recorded history? I believe we have at least established that there were open questions in the minds of the scholars of all epochs concerning such beings. And on this point, Hartland does not disagree with McRitchie. Quote, Nothing is more likely than the transfer to the mythical beings of Celtic superstition of some features derived from alien races. In his conclusion to his discussion of the pygmy theory, which he rejects as Hartland does, Wentz remarks that it leaves all the problems of the historical origins of the fairy faith unsolved, since it is clearly global, not limited to the Celtic lands. Thus A. Lang, in his introduction to the 1922 edition of Kirk's book, states that, to my mind at least, the subterranean inhabitants of Mr. Kirk's book are not so much a traditional recollection of a real dwarfish race living underground, a hypothesis of Sir Walter Scott, as a lingering memory of the Chthonian beings, the ancestors. Folklore in the making. No matter how interesting it may be to speculate on the origin of these ancient beliefs, the opportunity to observe folklore in the making is even more attractive to those with an inclination toward research. When modem rumours appear to fall into the very same patterns that have puzzled generations of scientists, theologians and literary scholars, the feeling one gets is a mixture of gratitude and enthusiasm. When the phone rings in Wright-Patterson Air Force Base and a local intelligence officer transmits the observation of a motorist, who has just been buzzed by what he describes as a flying saucer. We are really witnessing the unique conjunction of the modern world, with its technology and ancient terrors, with all the power of their sudden fugitive irrational nature. We are in a very privileged position. Neither Wentz nor Hartland was able to interview people who had just observed the phenomena they studied. Most of their witnesses spoke of days gone by, of stories heard by the fireplace. We feel, on the other hand, that we can almost reach out into the night and grab those lurking entities. We are hot on their trail. The air is still vibrating with excitement. The smell of sulphur is still there when the story is recorded. Take, for instance, the story of the Air Force Colonel, who was driving at night on a lonely Illinois road when he noticed that a strange object was flying above his car. It looked, he said, like a bird, but it was the size of a small airplane. 
It flapped its wings and flew away. This is the type of horror story adolescent girls sometimes tell their mothers when they come home late and a bit nervous. But an Air Force colonel? During November through December 1966, West Virginia was plagued by a similar bird called the Mothman by imaginative reporters. One witness, 25-year-old Thomas Urey, who lives in Clarksburg, met the creature at 7.15 a.m. on November 25, 1966, in the vicinity of Point Pleasant. It was a large grey thing which rose from a nearby field. It came up like a helicopter and veered over my car, he told John Keel, who spent many days in the area investigating the reports. He accelerated up to 75 mph, but the bird was still there, casually circling the car. It appeared to be about six feet long, with a wing spread of eight to ten feet. According to other witnesses quoted by Keel, the figure had large, round, glowing red eyes. On January 11, 1967, Mrs. McDaniel saw the bird herself in broad daylight. She was outside her home when she observed what appeared to be a small plane flying down the road almost at treetop level. As it drew closer, she realized it was a man-shaped object with wings. It swooped low over her head and circled a nearby restaurant before going out of sight. Mrs. McDaniel, who works in the Point Pleasant Unemployment Office, is known in the community as a rational and responsible person. Now consider this report. The intruder was tall, thin and powerful. He had a prominent nose and bony fingers of immense power which resembled claws. He was incredibly agile. He wore a long, flowing cloak of the sort affected by opera-goers, soldiers and strolling actors. On his head was a tall, metallic-seeming helmet. Beneath the cloak were close-fitting garments of some glittering material like oilskin or metal mesh. There was a lamp strapped to his chest. Oddest of all, the creature's ears were cropped or pointed like those of an animal. Was it a prankster in a Batman dress? It seems entirely possible, especially when we take into account the fact that the bird was carrying something on its back and made incredible leaps, actually flying on one occasion, above the heads of would-be captors. There is only one trouble with this explanation. The latter episode took place not in West Virginia in 1966, but in the dark lanes of a London suburb in November 1837. Like the Mothman of Point Pleasant, the mysterious Flying Man of London was ignored by authorities as long as possible. Finally, a resident of Peckham wrote a letter to the Lord Mayor, and the censorship could no longer be maintained. Nightly, horse patrols searched the countryside. Admiral Codrington set up a reward fund, still unclaimed by the way. And Jay Viner, in a remarkable article about the mystery, informs us that even the old Duke of Wellington himself set holsters at his saddle bow and rode out after dark in search of spring heel Jack. On February 20th, 1838, a girl of 18, Jane Alsop, of Old Ford near Bow, London, heard a violent ringing of the front door bell. Going out, she faced the most hideous appearance of spring heel Jack. He wore shining garments and a flashing lamp on his chest. His eyes resembled glowing balls of fire. When Miss Alsop uttered a cry, the intruder grabbed her arm in claw-like fingers, but the girl's sister rushed to her rescue. The visitor spurted a fiery gas in Jane's face, and she dropped unconscious. Then Jack fled, dropping his cloak, which was picked up at once by another shadow who ran after him. Two days earlier, though not revealed until after the old Ford incident had made headlines, a Miss Scales of Limehouse was walking through Green Dragon Alley. The alley was a dim-lit passage beside a public house, and when she saw a tall figure lurking in the shadows, Miss Scales hesitated, waiting for her sister who had fallen behind. The sister, who described the loiterer as tall, thin, and save the mark gentlemanly, came up in time to see his long cloak thrown aside and a lantern flashing on the startled girl. There was no time to scream. Jack's weird blue flame spurted into his victim's face and she dropped to the ground in a deep swoon whereupon Jack walked away calmly. Viner suggests that Jack had a rendezvous in Green Dragon Alley and wanted to get rid of witnesses. A week after the old Ford incident, he knocked on the door of Mr. Ashworth's house in Turner Street and inquired for him. The servant who opened the door screamed the place down. Jack fled. He was never seen again, in the London neighbourhood at least. Had a contact been made? It is strange indeed, as Viner remarks, that Springheel Jack should have paid two visits within two days to houses less than a mile apart, 
whose owners were named Alsop and Ashworth, respectively. Two of the main witnesses, as in West Virginia, were young girls. With them, in the two cases, were their sisters. There seems to be a pattern here, but rather typically, it is once again an absurd one. In 1877, wearing tight garments and shining helmet, Jack was seen again at Aldershot, Hampshire, England. On that occasion, he flew above two sentries, who fired at him. He answered with a burst of blue fire, which left them stunned and vanished. Viner believes that Jack was again to blame for the scare in late August 1944 in Mattoon, Illinois. He was seen at night, peering through windows, as in search for someone known to him by sight. Most of the witnesses were women. Some of them reported falling unconscious after a device was pointed at them by the visitor who left a strange, cloying smell. In the spring of 1960, Italian jeweler Salvatore Cianzi was driving in Sicily near Syracuse when a small being in shining clothes wearing a diving helmet appeared in the beam of the headlights. It had no arms but two little wings. Mr. Cianzi suffered a nervous shock. On Saturday, November 16, 1963, four teenagers were walking near Sandling Park, near Hythe, Kent, England. One of the four, 17-year-old John Flaxton, describes how they were frightened by an object which they first had taken to be a star. Quote, It was uncanny. The reddish-yellow light was coming out of the sly at an angle of 60 degrees. As it came towards the ground, it seemed to hover more slowly. End quote. A bright light, golden in colour, suddenly appeared in the field near them after the first object had been hidden by some trees. Quote, it was about 80 yards away, floating about 10 feet above the ground. It seemed to move along with us, stopping when we stopped as if it was observing us. The light was oval, about 15 to 20 feet across, with a bright solid core. It disappeared behind trees, and a few seconds later a dark figure shambled out. It was all black, about the size of a human, but without a head. It seemed to have wings like a bat on either side and came stumbling towards us. We didn't wait to investigate." End quote. Folklore in the making. From the far fadets, we have drifted to modern times with spring Jack and the Mothman. And we have seen our visitor's arsenal become more precise. Jack's lantern and ray gun have survived in modern tales, in 20th century comic books, in television series, but the real question is, could all this be real? And if not, how can we explain the consistency of these descriptions at a time when there were no comics and no television? The Italian artist R.L. Johannes had a remarkable experience in 1947, at a time when the name Flying Saucer was already popular in the United States, but when the now abundant documentation about the landings was non-existent. The date was, as he recalls, August 14th. He was hiking alone, following a small stream in the mountainous region between Italy and Yugoslavia. Among some rocks, he suddenly saw a large, brilliant, red, lens-shaped object about 10 yards in diameter. Close to it, he discovered two people, whom he first regarded as kids, until he realized they were dwarfs, of a type he had never seen before. The two beings were under three feet tall. Their heads were larger than a man's head. They had no hair, eyelashes or eyebrows. Their faces were greenish, their noses straight, their mouths wide slits, giving them something of the appearance of a fish. Their eyes were huge, round and prominent, their color yellow-green. The skin around their eyes formed rings rather than eyelids. As Johannes moved, one of the beings touched his belt. At once from the center of the belt something like a ray and a puff of vapor were emitted. Johannes experienced something like an electrical discharge and found himself on the ground, helpless and very weak. It took all his energy to turn his head around and observe the two beings as they walked away. A moment later, they were gone. In 1965, a case very similar to Johannes's was reported to the US Air Force, and we tried in vain to get an active investigation of it by Project Blue Book. Finally, the case was leaked at my suggestion, to a civilian group, which conducted a speedy and careful study of the testimony given by the only witness, a Mr. S. The details of the testimony are available in an excellent book by the leaders of the civilian group, the Lorenzans, so I need not discuss all the circumstances of the observation. Some remarks concerning the case, called by the Lorenzans the most spectacular report we have examined, are relevant in the present context, however. 
The incident took place on September 4, 1964, in the mountains of Northern California, about eight miles from Cisco Grove. Mr. S had been hunting when he became separated from the party and lost his way. Night was falling, so he lighted some fires to call attention to his position. Soon he observed a light in the sky, which he thought was a helicopter looking for him. When it stopped and hovered silently nearby, however, he realized it was an unusual object and climbed a large tree to observe the situation from that vantage point. The light circled the tree. S saw a flash and a dark object falling to the ground. Next, he noticed one figure crashing through the woods below him and another moving in from a slightly different direction. Both figures approached the tree and looked at him. They were a little over five feet tall, the witness estimates, and clothed in a silvery uniform that covered their heads. A third creature appeared later, behaving more like a mechanical being than an animal or a man. It was darker and had two reddish-orange eyes. It had no mouth, but rather a slit-leak opening that would drop open like an oven door. For the rest of the time S was conscious, the entities used a variety of means to try to get him to fall from his tree. He managed to keep them away by throwing lighted bits of paper and clothing at them, to which they reacted in fear. The main weapon used against him was a very curious one. If we are to believe this report, the robot-like entity would let its lower jaw drop, then place its hand inside the rectangular cavity thus revealed and emit a puff of smoke in S's direction. The smoke would spread like a mist, and upon reaching him, it would make him lose consciousness for a certain time. The effect of it was comparable to being suddenly deprived of oxygen, S said. It is hard to believe the story. Would not such beings as he describes be able to climb a tree? If they came out of a flying saucer, why could they not fly up to his refuge? But it is equally difficult to prove that he simply had a nightmare. The witness is not given to such behavior. And when he woke up at dawn, still tied to the tree with his belt, all the objects he had dropped in an effort to get rid of the intruders were still lying around. Furthermore, there is the description of the strange, powerful gas which plays such an important role in the story as it does in the incidents related to spring Jack, the Johannes sighting, and the Sunny Disverger's case of August 1952. According to Captain Ruppelt's report of his investigations in Florida, Desverger's, a scoutmaster who went into a wood to investigate a strange light, and faced, he said, a horrible being who looked at him from the turret of a flying machine, unlike anything he had ever seen, found himself breathing the same peculiar gas. Quote, he froze where he stood and noticed a small ball of red fire began to drift toward him. As it floated down, it expanded into a cloud of red mist. He dropped his light and machete and put his arms over his face. As the mist enveloped him, Lai passed out. End quote. This is confirmed by the unpublished memorandum written by Ruppelt on September 12, 1952, upon his return from West Palm Beach. Captain Ruppelt and Lieutenant R. M. Olson began their investigation by a conference with Captain Corney, Wing Intelligence Officer with the 1707th Air Base Wing, on the morning of September 9th. Quote, a conference was held with Captain Corney to determine whether or not there had been any late developments in this case that the two attic officers were not familiar with. Captain Corney stated that to his knowledge, there was nothing outstanding that had happened. He was asked about the facts of supposedly anonymous threatening telephone calls that Mr. Desvergers had received. He stated that Desvergers had called him approximately two weeks ago and stated that he had been receiving anonymous threatening telephone calls while at work in the establishment in which he is employed. The gist of the calls was telling Desvergers to lay off of his story and that if he didn't, he would be sorry and several other things. End quote. Not much attention was given to this claim, however, and Ruppelt continued his investigations by interviewing people who knew the scoutmaster and especially the members of the scout group who were with him in the car when he decided to go into the woods. Quote, he gave the boys instructions to go get help if he wasn't back in 10 minutes and started in the woods. The boys claimed that they could see his flashlight going back into the woods. From this point on, the boys' stories varied to a certain degree. End quote. The first boy states, quote, that he did not see the first light that Desvergers saw, however, shortly afterwards. After Desvergers had got out, 
made the statement about flying saucers and got back into the automobile. He looked out of the window and saw a semicircle of white lights about three inches in diameter going down at an angle of 45 degrees into the trees. None of the other Boy Scouts saw this. He then states that he saw Desvergers go back into the woods and that the next thing that he saw was a series of red lights in the clearing. As soon as he saw the red lights, he claims that he saw Sonny stiffen up and fall, end quote, according to two other boys. Quote, they both saw Desvergers going through the woods, could see flashlights flashing on the trees, and then he disappeared for a few seconds. At least the light disappeared. The next thing they saw was a series of red lights. They said they looked a lot like flares or sly rockets. The lights were not making any definite pattern. Some of them were going up, some of them were going down, or going around and around in all directions. It just seemed to be a type of six or eight red lights going in all directions. This time they ran down the road to get help. End quote. Here we have confirmation from witnesses of the observation of red lights. The witnesses were not close enough, however, to experience the lights effects. But it is interesting to remark that the lights kept going around and around after the scoutmaster, according to his own account of the incident, was already unconscious. It is also interesting to note in this connection that over a century ago, La Rue de Lancy, in his Livre des Légendes, had this to say about the elves. Quote, If a mortal being dares come near them, they open their mouth and struck by the breath which escapes from it, the imprudent fellow dies poisoned. End quote. On October 7th, 1954, Mr. Marguillon saw an object which had landed in a field in Monteux, France. It was shaped like a hemisphere, about two and a half yards in diameter. The witness gasped for air and felt paralysed during the observation. The sudden lack of air noted in the Cisco Grove case is not infrequently reported by witnesses of landings, nor are the peculiar eyes of the small entities, reddish-orange, glowing in the dark. On October 9, 1954, in Lavoux, Vienne, France, a farmer who was riding his bicycle suddenly stopped as he saw a figure dressed in a sort of diving suit, aiming a double light beam at him. The individual, who seemed to have boots without heels, very bright eyes and a very hairy chest, carried two headlights, one below the other, on the front of his suit. Nine days later, in fontenay torcy also in France, a man and his wife reported that they saw a red cigar-shaped object in the sky. All of a sudden it dived toward them, leaving a reddish trail, and landed behind some bushes. Upon reaching the top of a hill, the witnesses found themselves confronted by a bulky individual, human in appearance but only about three feet tall. He wore a helmet, and his eyes glowed with an orange light. One of the witnesses lost consciousness. Four other people saw the object in flight from another spot. A third group of independent witnesses in another town, Sanson la Poterie, saw the craft fly away at tremendous speed in a westerly direction. The countryside was illuminated over an area one to two miles wide. It is indeed appropriate to tell the man who investigates such cases in the words of Robert Herrick, Her eyes the glowworm lend thee, the shooting stars attend thee, and the elves also, whose little eyes glow like the sparks of fire befriend thee. <laughs>